Peggy, thank you for being here. This is the third chapter of Face to Face International. In the first two chapters, we've had conversations about um, international students, how what it's like to come to the United States from somewhere else. We've had questions about how knowledge is produced in libraries and in the arts. We're going to ba back to the first idea about talking about international students, but also not just international students, but international students who become um, professors and deans, and in this case, a provost. So really, the conversation starts with taking you back to when you were at university in Athens. Can you tell us where you went to university, what you studied, um, and maybe one of your strongest memories from that time? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to go back in time and share some experiences. This is a wonderful thing to do. Um, so let me uh, take you back a little bit. I studied at the National Technical University of Athens in Greece, which is the premier engineering school in, in Greece. Uh, studied engineering with um, emphasis on infrastructure engineering. And uh, it was a very positive, a fun time for me, um, mainly because I made friends, uh, because it was an opportunity for me to explore what I like and what I do not like academically, um, because I had the freedom to pursue things for myself. I was safe at home. Uh, I knew everything. Uh, I knew the expectations. It was a very familiar environment. I can tell you I chose engineering in particular because it was um, something that combined theory and, and applied mm -hmm. um, things. And I chose infrastructure engineering without much thought because I thought it was more unusual than the traditional uh, engineering disciplines. Uh, I don't know what else to tell you that, but these years, this my program was a five-year program, uh, BSMS combined. It included a diploma thesis that takes a whole semester uh, and more. And um, it was um, a, a part of what I expected would happen to me as I was growing up, mm -hmm. you know. It was what you expected as growing up. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's talk about that a little bit, especially with the idea of eventually you come to the U.S. When you're an undergraduate student in the U.S., and this does not apply to everybody, but to many of our students at William & Mary, they've been preparing to leave home, right, and yes. go somewhere else. Yes. But you, you didn't do that, and no. that's not what happens in Greece. No. So can you just help us see that model a little bit more clearly? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, um, higher education is free in Greece, um, and but in order to, it, it has a different process uh, to um, that than in the U.S. Uh, uh, what I mean by that is that the process to uh, apply and get accepted is different. So uh, because it's free, um, the process is very selective. Uh, there are other opportunities for students, but the uh, premier schools are very difficult to get in. There is a national exam that everybody takes, and depending on your performance and the levels of you know um, performance of others, you can get, be successful or not. So the part that you know is familiar is knowing the system. There is no surprises. Uh, there is no let's put together an interesting incoming class like it is in the US. Mm -hmm. The incoming class is what your scores determine it to be. Um, so your focus as a high school student is I learn enough to be able to be successful in the national exams uh, and I know what I'm, I'm planning for. Uh, so that part was, was familiar. Um, as a result, uh, most the ex so a lot of students can really go in different towns in Greece, like different universities, because perhaps you know when you are from Athens and you want to study engineering in Athens, engineering in Athens is very tough to get into, and you don't have the scores. You go engineering in a different city. These are the students who can move from their homes and start 
fresh somewhere else. But it's not because they are looking forward to doing right. this. Mm -hmm. It's because it so happened that, you know, my scores got me to this engineering school. I, w I did not want to leave Athens. I had mm -hmm. a great, you know, time. I had, this is where my family was. So the expectation was not to go somewhere else and be on your own. The expectation was I live at home. I have my parents take care of me. I do what I want to do. And at the end of the day, I sleep and everything is taken care of for me. So I know it sounds immature, but that was part of how we expected our college years to be. Mm -hmm. uh, at least those of us who grew up in, a, in, a, in an environment like I grew up in. And that's what I was looking for. I wasn't interested in studying in mm -hmm. elsewhere in Greece because that would mean that I would be on my own. And I did not want that. Um, and that also created the conditions for me to look for graduate school somewhere else because I lived that. I was, you know, 22 at the time. And I thought, hey, now it's the time for me to try something else different, be on my own. I was more mature at that point. And that's why I did not consider graduate school in Greece or even in Europe. That is like two or three hours away from, from home. I wanted something totally different. So that you are more mature at 22 than like 18. However, that is a really big leap then. You're going from Athens to Ohio. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about yeah. Ohio. Well, if I knew then what I know now, it wouldn't have been such an easy le leap. Uh, but at the time, there was no internet. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no way to um, have a, a virtual tour or mm -hmm. know what to expect. So what I knew, as, as an undergraduate student, I had uh, internships and opportunities to work in Europe. Uh, I spent time in the UK, in London, in um, okay. the Netherlands, yeah. in Finland. So I really traveled around Europe and it wasn't that much different, to be honest sure. with you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I felt that I explored um, higher education or what opportunities um, universities had to offer me academically in Europe. It was short-sighted in a sense that there's more, more than what I was able to see. But in my mind at the time, I was like, okay, I know this world. Everybody was talking about how ter how terrific higher education was in, in the U.S., what opportunities existed, how different and how everybody who uh, was academically strong can prosper and do great things early mm -hmm. and quickly. And that's what appealed to me uh, is that this is different. I want to try it. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I don't have to make a decision. It was kind of like one of those things that was safe and in and and path of le mm -hmm. least resistance because I, I, it was like a, an academic environment. I was good at that and I would, didn't have to worry about a job or anything. I would continue my studies and explore a different country. Now I knew enough about the United States from the movies or, you know, you know what, that's how you yeah. learn about other mm -hmm. countries in the pre-internet era. So I felt very comfortable being mm -hmm. there. I spoke the language. And um, so it was a very easy decision. My parents supported me in this. Um, and I remember leaving Greece very easily, not thinking that this is permanent or long-term or a huge leap, as you said. It was like, slept very nicely the night before. I woke up the next day, put, put, took my things and, and, and went to the airport. Um, I'm thinking of my parents and how emotional they were. And I was like, guys, come on. I mean, like, you know, I'll be back in a few months. So it was partly ignorance of what this meant because I hadn't lived it. Part confidence and that I can do this. And part um, excitement yeah. about something new yeah. that, something that new. made it easy for me um, in retrospect. You know, it wasn't an easy thing to do, and I recognize it now. But at the time, I thought it was natural. It's cool. So, um, English, the English language. Mm -hmm. How how did you grow up speaking English in your house? No, but you know, Greek is not a language that you can really mm -hmm. you know use many times outside Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it helps a lot with you know knowledge, 
uh, because Greek is the root of everything. As we know, if you watched uh, my big fat Greek wedding, you know that everything <laughs> goes back to a Greek word, which is true, actually, you know, just saying. Uh, but um, in school and uh, as extracurriculars, most Greek kids learn foreign languages. I studied three languages, uh, started with French, uh, English and German. And you go to, I mean, my, my mother was very, very adamant about this. You go to study uh, in a very structured way so that your knowledge is not just oral skills or writing skills, is understanding the language and the culture. So I, you know, I had that throughout my high school and, you know, college education. And uh, I felt very comfortable with the language. It sounds like you just slid into graduate school. And do you still have friends from Ohio State? Yes, yes, not many, but some. Uh, it, I can tell you the transition was not very easy when I mm. got there. Yes. Um, in the sense that this was Ohio. I did not know what that meant. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, yeah, one of the 50 states, mm -hmm. Columbus, Ohio, big city. I mean, lots of things to do. Well, not really. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, compared to my life in Athens, it was totally different. Yeah. And again, pre-internet days, uh, did not know how, you know, that the downtown area is not the best area of the city. I thought, you know, this is how it is in Europe. You go to the, you know, downtown area and everything mm -hmm. is there. I arrived at a time where uh, public transportation was on strike. So, you know, did not have a car initially, I thought, you know, I can take a taxi. No, uh, not easy. You cannot go and yeah. hail a taxi in the street. Uh, you cannot take the bus because there was no bus. And even if there were buses, you know, it's a di totally yeah. different thing. I did not know where to go to buy stuff for my dorm. Uh, I stopped outside a consignment store because that was the only thing that I saw that had blankets or something. Uh, I wanted to buy a TV from a convenience store because I did not know where to go. I saw there was a TV there that was apparently for sale. And the taxi person who took me there said, you don't buy a TV from a convenience store. <laughs> so, I mean, these are these are all real. Mm -hmm. I was walking around downtown Columbus, Ohio with, um, you know, a few thousand dollars in my pocket, mm -hmm. not knowing that, you, you know, I could be that, healed yeah. for much yeah. less. So it was it was a, a transition. I mean, uh, the one thing, you know, there were several things that helped me. Um, the, you know, Graduate Student Association helped. The Greek students who were already there, there were many of them. The university was big and there was a whole, you know, uh, association of, of Greek students at Ohio State helped a lot. But it was it was a transition and it took me a while to get used to this. Um, and the snow in May, <laughs> all those, all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So graduate students get more and more specialized, which is what would have happened with you, and end up writing a dissertation and becoming an expert in a particular area of a discipline. Mm -hmm. What happened with you in terms of graduate school and getting focused on um, what your specialization would be? So this is another, I mean, I do feel that certain things point you in a direction that makes you more comfortable with how you think and, and uh, how you envision your life in the future. So I, I started by wanting to do infrastructure monitoring, particularly with respect to uh, archaeological sites, because this was, um, you know, an important yeah. part in Greece and ended up um, doing applications that are for, um, national security, satellite systems, that was totally different than where I started from. Because I discovered that I do not particularly enjoy field work. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that come with that, you know, chunky shoes, mm -hmm. wearing hard hats, mm -hmm. you know, what that does to hair. So I, it sounds superficial, but it was kind of like, not really it what it was. Right. You know, yeah. it didn't, it didn't. But as I was working on certain topics related to that, I discovered ways that were emerging at the time as innovative ways of monitoring without physical presence. And this was satellite systems, GPS systems, um, computer vision, and you know processing imagery to extract information in an automatic manner. 
that I started focusing on these techniques. And these techniques had less applications at the time um, that were related to archaeological sites and more applications towards, you know, um, mapping and um, guidance, navigation, and uh, creating um, autonomous systems that process information in an autonomous manner when you have satellite systems that, that collect so much data and not having enough uh, manpower to process this. So that got me into uh, applications that have to do with uh, security, defense, and my field was image processing. Uh, so I, I okay. moved from towards, you know, and that was part of more computational sciences, mm -hmm. like in computer science or in, in environments of that kind. Uh, that's my story. I, I really, you know, met a faculty member uh, in mm -hmm. my studies that was doing work there. Mm -hmm. And we worked together in projects. I got into research very early. Mm -hmm. My environment at Ohio State was very research oriented. Mm -hmm. My position was funded always through external funding. And I learned the process well uh, at that time. So there might be some people who watch this uh, video who don't know what what image processing is. Can you explain what it is? Of course. Uh, image processing and analysis, I should add, is uh, developing um, uh, automated processes or computer-based processes to improve the quality of an image mm -hmm. uh, to um, attribute uh, geographic locations or other kinds of information to an image and get it from it and create derivative products of this. So in other words, an image comes in and you extract information on it, but there is a process of enhancing the image first, the process of automating the uh, extraction of features uh, for the image, the process of organizing the features into something that makes sense. Uh, and then of course, you know, um, creating knowledge based on this. Right. Okay. That's uh, where I would like to go from there is, is a, a conversation about um, methodologies and whether they are the same around the world. So you studied um, at Ohio State, a major research university in the United States. You are working in the area of image processing. Could you have done that anywhere or if you had stayed in Athens mm -hmm. and went to graduate school mm -hmm. in Athens, would the study have been the same? That is a very good question. Um, there were a few clusters of activity in the world at the mm -hmm. time. Um, the United States, Ohio State was one, mm -hmm. very prominent. Um, Switzerland, uh, which I went, which is where I went next uh, after I graduated, uh, was another. Germany, Greece. Too, mm -hmm. uh, my alma mater had some faculty members who were engaged mm -hmm. in this kind of research, not for defense applications, but mm -hmm. for monitoring of infrastructure and you know archaeological sites and other things, as I said, uh, and also satellite systems, um, who, by the way, were graduates of the Ohio State Department that I went to, mm -hmm. and that's why I ended mm -hmm. up going there. So it wasn't a worldwide people did not know enough to know what a gps was it uh -huh. was you know technology that was very limited in terms of how it was used and who understood what it mm -hmm. was um so i don't think that my trajectory would have been the same mm -hmm. because what i ended up doing was determined by also by where the funding was coming from and what opportunities were that were there for me to be engaged as a researcher, mm -hmm. as a student, as a RA uh, in these yeah. in these opportunities. I mean, if if the funding were different, uh, perhaps I would have gotten into medical application, sure. which mm -hmm. you know was another possibility. Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that my selection of environments to uh, to be at. Uh, determine the topics and the specialization of my work. Yes. Okay. That's that. That makes a lot of sense. So you mentioned that you worked with a professor, a specific professor. Did you then, or did you eventually also work like on research teams? Yes. Yes. The professor had uh, a small group mm -hmm. of students, um, international. Mm -hmm. uh, international. Yes. Uh, most of them. I mean, there were American students as well, but uh, this was a PhD group uh, 
a lot of students uh, mm -hmm. from various places, um, I, you know, uh, around the globe, uh, which was, I think, to me, yeah. going back to my experience as an international student, was a great uh, new thing because I, I, I came from Greece, which at the time was very homogeneous. Mm -hmm. So all everybody was Greek. Everybody, you know, yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I, I leave it at that. So coming into an environment where you had people from the Philippines, from Israel, from, you know, other European countries, from South America, I mean, it kind of opens up your mind and demystifies, you know, the differences that we think we have and emphasizes the similarities. So yeah. these people became good friends. And, you know, we discovered through our, you know, differences, how similar we are and opens up, this opens up your mind. And this is, you know, I think the, a huge benefit of not staying where your comfort environment yeah. is and doing something else. Yeah. Uh, as you know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I love that. So it makes me wonder about then as people like the graduate students you were with become professionals or professors somewhere, are the teams that ultimately develop, do they remain international teams or do people go back into sort of working with whoever is around them more locally? So um, that is an excellent question. Let me think a bit about it. So what, what being a member of an international, uh, the professor I worked with was also international. Uh, he was from, from Switzerland. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were a totally international group. Now, some of the group members went back to their countries and they mm -hmm obviously worked more closely with people from from their countries but because of the connections that yeah. were formed they remained um significant in you know in the international la landscape so they never gave up mm -hmm. participation in multi you know country multinational mm -hmm. projects or um conferences and so that yeah. changes the way you think about Absolutely. what you do even if you go back even if i were to go back i mean i've seen people who went back to their countries and they still remain very active mm -hmm. internationally because they had that experience yeah. and this is priceless yeah. i mean this is what creates this kind of network of mm -hmm. uh, work that brings everybody together not necessarily geographically but intellectually yeah. Yeah. It changes you professionally. Absolutely. For, forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so you've had some work that is also outside the academy. Yes. Right? Yes. In Maine? Well. There was a startup that you were yeah, part of. Yeah, is that in yeah, Maine? that was in Maine. Okay. That was well, in Maine. What was that? Uh, so that was, I mean, it was outside the academic environment, but it was triggered by the work mm -hmm. that we were doing um, in, you know, in, in, um, in our academic environment. So. Uh, the work that I was working on, I, at the time I was an assistant professor um, and uh, the work, my work was funded by the National Science Foundation and NASA uh, through various projects. I was very successful um, in terms of attracting external funding. And, uh, and then we developed some things that mm -hmm. could transition very well into products. Uh, so typically oh. the, the, the landscape in an academic setting in the past, I mean, at that time, now it's much better, uh, kind of wraps up when you produce a PhD, the dissertation is defended, goes onto the shelf, and then you other, have others pick up where you, others left off. But it's really the transition between something that is in a, in a lab in, mm -hmm. you know, in the university and something that people use is very yeah. difficult. So because we were working on technologies that had a lot of potential, you know, a lot of potential for commercial developments, uh, there are fun there is funding out there for uh, technology transfer and small business, uh, sp small mm -hmm. businesses. And well, we created a small, you know, business that uh, the university had a an incubator uh, space where startup companies can really have administrative support and offices uh, paid by the university initially, where they could start something different than just, you know, uh, uh, what happens in an academic setting. And ultimately, as they really got more funding externally, they could start paying rent or other things and, you know, to support yeah. that. So that's what we did. We created this. It was affiliated with a um, company in, in Boston. 
So it was kind of like connected to the company, but it was an, mm -hmm. its own LLC. We got funding uh, from, you know, uh, these funds that uh, are out there uh, from the federal government to support small mm -hmm. businesses and technology transfer. So we hired and we started doing things. And then I moved to a different university and I left it all behind. Yeah. <laughs> so I can imagine, though, that you could, given what you studied, you could have taken a path that was outside of the academy. Absolutely. Um, all PhDs don't have that opportunity, but you did, mm -hmm. and yet you ended up mm -hmm. building a career in universities. Yeah. So what's that choice about? Yeah, that that is another excellent question that I've thought about many times in my career. Um, um, my skill set that, that I developed through my studies was very marketable. Uh, and I could have, I mean, initially I was debating, should I go with industry and the opportunities that it offers, or should I stay mm -hmm. in an academic yeah. setting? I'm a kind of like, you know, I felt very comfortable in an academic setting. And, and, and mm -hmm. my, my, my life was led by serendipity. Uh, so before I graduated with my PhD, I got a, an offer from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, which is one of the best universities That's in fun. the world in Zurich for an academic position. I didn't interview. I mean, it was like I met people oh. at a conference. They mm -hmm. were impressed with the work. They sent me an offer for a position. Uh, and um, I can tell you it was one step towards going back to Greece. Mm -hmm. Like I was thinking. Oh, mm -hmm. great. I don't mm -hmm. even have to go and yeah. find a job. This is great. Wonderful institution. I thought I was getting paid a lot of money because I did not know how expensive life was in Zurich. So I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> and then you go there and you discover no. But anyway, yeah. um, that was really something that led me to stay in an academic setting, at least for my first job after that, because it happened this way. Mm -hmm. Then it was, you know, while I was there, it was it was a step towards going back to Greece, which was my mm -hmm. plan all along. And I did not know what to do after that. While I was there, I got another offer from a U.S. institution, uh, which had gotten significant funding from NSF to create a national center. And they had great opportunities for assistant professors like me. And I ended up going there, which was the University of Maine at the time, an R1 institution with a lot of funding in my area that was a great center between UC Santa Barbara and SUNY Buffalo and the University of Maine that gave me tremendous opportunity and experience in research. The moment you start getting into this, you don't then, leave. then it's very difficult to mm -hmm. really stop it and do something totally different mm -hmm. unless there is reason. So you get, get into the process of thinking new ideas, writing proposals, submitting proposals, getting the funding, hiring the students, seeing them graduate, and you do it all over again. Mm -hmm. And that becomes part of, you know, the enjoyment of being in the creation of new knowledge. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. And the rest is yeah. history. Is yeah, day. right. So that means that the part of the pl part of the plan about going back to Greece is the part that didn't happen. I bet yeah. that there are times every day, maybe when you think about Greece. True, and I, I think the older I get, the more I think mm -hmm. of this, uh, because you know my mother and my family are still there. My mother is getting older. I go back, and you know it's a wonderful place to be, uh, as you know. And I missed a lot of things uh, there. There was no financial reason for me not to be there, which makes it even harder. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, I mean, it, it, it's life took me where it took me mm -hmm. and no regrets because I enjoyed every part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I always felt that I would end up mm -hmm. back in Greece. Mm -hmm. It seems highly unlikely now before I retire. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't plan to retire anytime yeah. soon. So, uh, but the world became smaller uh, yes. with internet. I remember when I was uh, at Ohio State to read the news from Greece, uh, mm -hmm. I would go to the library and check out the Greek newspapers that were one week old. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, I'm thankful because my, my dad um, was a journalist and he would call me every day in the morning, give me the summary oh. of the news. You know, just our thing. You know, he would call me and say, hey, how are you doing? Good. Okay. What's happening? He said, let me, let me, you know, he put the, you know, uh, the, the phone next to the radio uh, where it would mm -hmm. summarize for five minutes the news of the day in Greece. 
And that would be oh. my, you know, my communication. Free internet. Of course, it was the director of, you know, the news, uh, that, that, that part of the news. So it was easy for us to do that. But uh, anyway, yeah. so now it's not the same. I mean, we have TV channels. We have, you know, so the world has gotten smaller. We communicate more easily. We see each other. We really, okay. you know, uh, we learn everything immediately everywhere in the world. So it doesn't feel the same, mm -hmm. but still, yeah, it is something that it's in the yeah. back of my head. Oh. So we're getting close to finishing, but there is then one more question I think I want to ask you. It has to do with, uh, I didn't set out to talk to you about your job as provost, but I think we should put one question in there in, in that regard. Do you think that the trajectory that you've had coming from a country other than where you live now, um, studying science, having worked in um, in a place that's not the academy, having traveled, been in Switzerland, Greece, the U.S., Maine, Ohio, all, all of that, has any of, or all of that made a difference in how you approach the job of being provost? I'd like to think that, yes, I mean, the way we operate in leadership positions is affected by our experiences in life. And I've been fortunate enough to um, see the good and the bad of the academic environment mm -hmm. from many perspectives. So um, as with uh, my graduate studies and where I ended up being, uh, this came up, you know, by, by chance. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't something that I ever really aspired to do. I actually did not know much about academic administration and had no interest mm -hmm. because there were so many other things that I was doing that I felt passionate about. And that, I think, gave mm -hmm. me good preparation to be an observer of, you know, academic mm -hmm. leadership with no personal interest mm -hmm. in it. Uh, I was a faculty senator, for instance, and, you know, participated in that never imagining that I would be on the other side of the table. And so I think that gives me, uh, I'd like to think that it gives me more objectivity because it wasn't, I didn't adapt my develop, the development of my skills thinking that this is a career I want to pursue. So I right. didn't, you know, it wasn't deliberately, I wasn't looking at people thinking how this is done and how I would be doing it or what do I need to do to bring myself to be successful in that, it sort of happened. Yeah. So being an international person, um, being a woman in engineering, um, mm -hmm. having seen a lot of different perspectives throughout my career uh, has helped me, I think, understand the value of um, not resting on your laurels, mm -hmm. uh, which would have been the easy path for me to um, when I, you know, being in Greece as a graduating sure. from a very highly respected institution, um, being in an, you know, my family being very comfortable and creating a, you know, a life there. I didn't do that because, you know, I thought that this would give me more opportunities to evolve as a person. So I think that, mm -hmm. that all these things that I've seen, again, the good and the bad have helped me see that as, my ancestors say everything changes. Mm -hmm. Even if you think you you are not changing, the rest of the world around you changes. So you cannot step into the same river twice. And that I think was a great lesson yeah. for me to learn. Hopefully, it helped in my you know um, development as not only as a as an academic but also as a an academic leader. Yeah. I love ending on this note of not stepping in the same river twice. And I want to thank you very much for coming. Uh, much appreciated, enjoyable conversation. And, and I, I think we all learned a lot. Well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to reminisce a little bit yeah. and uh, um, share some experiences.